All right. We are going to go ahead and get started. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today at the Film Museum's <laughs> Watson Armor uh, Seminar Series. Um, this is STEM, uh, Black and STEM, part two. And we have a really great panel set up for you all today. Um, I'd like to introduce myself first. My name is Ilana Wilhite. I work here at the Film Museum in the Keller Science Action Center. And in the center, we uh, put a lot of scientists on display and we introduce their work to the community. And so that the community know that these are positions that they themselves can be in and also have uh, a lot of input and say so in their communities for how we interact and use the work that the scientists uh, put into play. Uh, we also have an educator um, that will be able to speak to how do you get into these type of professions and how should you prepare yourself um, if these are one of the roles that you want to take up later on in life or your academic career, just in general. We want to start by uh, giving some acknowledgments um, out, and then we're going to go into our speakers. We would like to begin today with a land acknowledgement and affirmation at the beginning of the museum events and recognition, recognition that past collecting and exhibition practices have deeply harmed Native communities. The Native North American Hall reopening later this year marks that new beginning. The land on which the Field Museum resides is an unceded territory of the Potawatomi Nation and also home for the Ottawa Ojibwe Nations, the Three Fires Confederacy. Chicago was home to the OHEC, the Miami Nations, the site of trade, travel, and healing for more than a dozen other Native tribes. The state of Illinois is currently home to more than 75,000 tribal members. You are always on the land of Native nations. From here on out, I'm gonna now introduce our first speaker uh, as Mariah Green. Uh, Mariah is from Chicago, all right? And uh, she has a bachelor's in earth science from Northeastern Illinois University, highly influenced by her father, which sparked her interest in science, but also through the reading of books, documentaries, movies, trips, and to the film museum of all those trips. Uh, in May, 2021, um, she earned a master's in museum and field studies in the, paleo in the paleontology uh, field with a specialization from the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, Mariah is currently um, the Museum and Collections Manager at the Museum of Geosciences at Virginia Tech. And in this role, she ensures long-term preservation of the museum's extensive mineral rock and fossil collection. And additionally, she trains, supervises, and mentors undergraduate and graduate students who work in the museum's collection. She also coordinates outreach events for the museum and provides geoscience educational kits to local K through 12 schools. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and pass the baton over to Mariah. Thank you. I'm gonna share my screen next. All right, so hello everybody. I'm Mariah Green and I'm just gonna give you a brief overview um, similar to what Yolanda said, but I am the Museum and Collections Manager at the Museum of Geosciences at Virginia Tech. And I'm also a paleontologist, so I'm very excited to be able to talk about my path to STEM with you. So just to give you guys like some more background on like my origins and my root in paleontology, I was very influenced by my father as a young baby and as a young kid in paleontology. And that's mostly because my father himself was very interested in paleontology especially dinosaurs when he was a young child and he never outgrew it. But even though he didn't have a high school education himself, just his passion for paleontology and dinosaurs in general definitely rubbed off on me and I never outgrew it. And I'm very glad I did not outgrow it. I'm very happy to be the part of like the field of geosciences and paleontology. And some cool stuff that we did was read a lot of dinosaur books together. I definitely stayed in uh, watching different documentaries such as Walking with Dinosaurs. I definitely know about Jurassic Park, and the whole like uh, series from there. And just different things like taking different trips to the field museum all the time. As you can see a picture of me with Sue in the background. I absolutely adore Sue. And yeah, just a whole bunch of different dinosaur toys as you can kind of like see in some of my childhood photos with me like pushing around a sauropod in a stroller, me with like two T-Rex toys, especially the red T-Rex, which very was very influential to me having that like toy around. And yeah, it's just been really great. Um, so with my path, if you do a little bit of a little time jump, 
I did do my undergraduate degree at Northeastern Illinois University, and I had majored in earth sciences. But while I was majoring in earth sciences, I kind of considered a bunch of different uh, career paths at one point. I thought about astrogeology. I thought about hydrology. I thought about soil science. I thought about being a completely like hard rock like geologist at one point. But there was a turning point for me, actually, when I did an internship in 2014. Uh, it was at a soil lab in Indiana. And what was really cool about this internship was the fact that I ran into, while sorting the different like uh, soils, I had actually found some fossilized shells that was really cool and I was able to identify them. And the reason why I was able to easily identify them was because I had just taken the historical geology class um, that same semester. And so just being able to identify the shells and just think, whoa, this is like paleontology again, this brings me back to my roots. I wanna go back to my origins and roots in paleontology. and. I never outgrew it or anything. I just like came back and like, whoa, this is what I should consider for like a career field and just go for like graduate school for that. So it definitely like never died out. I'm glad I never did. I love paleontology. It was something that definitely makes my heart sing. So I also did a cool internship in the summer of 2016 at the Field Museum. And I will say it was definitely life-changing, extremely life-changing for me because I got a chance to work with Dr. Ken and Jelzik and also uh, Dr. Matthew McDowell. And it was a really cool project with working with sorting different like fossils from Weeks Cave, um, a cave in uh, Australia. And it was amazing because a lot of these fossil deposits came from caves and they were deposited by a particular like owl family. So it was cool to see what potential uh, owl family deposit. It was almost like doing a prehistoric crime scene investigation. And also just being a part of this internship really, really opened my eyes to a career in the museum field because I really enjoyed sorting the uh, fossils there. I enjoyed cataloging the specimens into the database as well. And just like opened my eyes like, whoa, this is something I can actually go into a career wise. And also still do geosciences and paleontology at the same time because I wasn't quite aware of that while I was an undergrad that I can do both or even have a museum career. So this internship really like turn my world up in a very like positive way. And it was like very life-changing for me to pursue, hey, I'm gonna go into the museum field, but also still do geosciences at the same time. So it was amazing. It definitely changed my life in a very positive way. And I appreciate it so much. It was awesome. So as we do another like time jump into the future. So in the fall of 2019, I was accepted into the University of Colorado Boulder and I did my uh, master's degree there. And I had an amazing time that I really did. Um, my graduate advisor was Dr. Jalen Everly, who's also a vertebrate paleontologist. And she studies uh, mammals, particularly mammals right after the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction, so the KPG extinction, which this extinction is very famous for wiping out the dinosaurs, pterosaurs, uh, ancient marine reptiles like mosasaurs, and also uh, plesiosaurs as well. So she studies life after that event particularly with mammals. And for my thesis, it was actually really cool what I got a chance to do because I had a chance to estimate bite force in recent mammals, so modern mammals that you see now like coyotes, uh, raccoons, different things like that, even a hyena. So that was amazing. But I also got a chance to estimate bite force in these early Paleocene mammals as you can like see on the screen here. So on the left, you have like Eoconodon and then on the right, you have Carcioptichus. So these are some of the early paleogene mammals that I got a chance to estimate its bite force, to learn what their bite forces could have been. And we can kind of get an idea maybe of what they were eating since we don't quite know what their diets were. We can make inferences from their teeth alone, but if we can learn a little bit more about like estimating their bite force, it gives us more information. Um, so what I was doing was taking 2D photographs, also uh, 3D surface scans and also 3D CT scans and estimating the bite force. And you can kind of see on the right-hand side, I have a skull of Eoconodon. Uh, on the very left is more of a 3D surface scan, and on the right is the actual picture of the skull itself um, that was provided by the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And what I did was like estimate the bite force from the photographs from the CT scans or the surface scan and also the actual like photograph. So that was amazing to me to be able to do that. Never in a million years did I think you could just use basic photographs in order to estimate bite force from. So it was amazing. I had a great time. And also in this program, I just got a chance to even learn even more about caring for different like fossil specimens and the museum collections and just understanding more of like museology itself. And I had a great time. I had a very caring advisor, Dr. Jalen Everly, and she was just like almost like a mother figure to me. So it was just an amazing uh, program to have like her support as a female paleontologist and help me get my feet more into the field, but then also in museum studies as well. So it's always good to have that support. 
and just some other cool things I did while I was in graduate school. So I got a chance to do fossil cavity mounts, which was amazing. Uh, these fossil cavity mounts are meant to like stabilize the fossils inside the ectophone with also some Tyvek like covering there. Um, so what I had stabilized in this picture, what you see is um, some vertebrae from a polycotylic plesiosaur, so some short neck plesiosaur from the late Cretaceous. And I just like stabilized the vertebrae. So when we're putting it in and out of like different cabinets, it stays stabilized and isn't moving as much. So I really had a fun time actually creating that because it kind of gave me a sense of saying, whoa, you really are good at cutting things and like making stuff with your hands. You're very more than capable of doing so. And it was just fun being able to do it and learn how to do it. I had a great time. And then also a really cool thing that I got a chance to do was CT scan some reptiles and frogs as well. So I worked with the vertebrate zoology department in order to do that. And the project was to CT scan different reptiles and frogs, um, different lizards and also amphibians from Mesoamerica as well for um, a different project. I think it was actually an NSF uh, grant that provided for that. So it was amazing because it gave me even more chance to learn how to CT scan um, using the X-ray microscope. So that was amazing. It gave me like more chance, kind of like based on what I was doing my thesis already, but this time working with reptiles. So I had a blast learning how to do that because never in a million years would I have thought that I could actually CT scan. And now that I know how to do it, it's just amazing. It's an awesome skill. And this is where I currently work at now. So the Museum of Geosciences at Virginia Tech. So as we said before, we have a whole bunch of different minerals, rocks and fossils. And it's actually amazing because I landed this job like a few months after I graduated with my master's degree at CU Boulder. And it was actually amazing. Um, going through that whole process and also just landing a job shortly after. So at this museum, we specialize mostly in minerals, rocks, and fossils. And there's a whole bunch of cataloging that goes on. Right now, we're doing the giant cataloging project right now for a mineral donation that was donated to us in 2020. So it's been a blast working with students and teaching them how to catalog in our museum's database. And also just being a getting a chance to like supervise and mentor them as well. I think that's really amazing and important. That's like a highlight for me. And the students are a highlight for me too, because I get a chance to teach them things that I've learned as I was coming through this field. And it's just good to be able to teach them as well. And they get a chance to do it. You can just see like the strength and empowerment on them. Like, whoa, I know how to catalog something or I know how to do this in museum studies. So it's really good to be able to like transfer your skills to other as well. And uh, we also have a lot of outreach going on too as well. Um, you can see in the picture here, I have one of my students. There's like a little picture that has a mat. There's supposed to be like a simulated dinosaur track that we simulated um, spray painted on the neoprene rug. And yeah, we just had students get a chance to like measure or try to estimate how fast the dinosaur was going. And on the right hand side, we just recently got of uh, some specimens donated to us. So four Tyrannosaur teeth. And also at the very top, that looks like aluminum foil. That's uh, actually a Triceratops vertebra that may show evidence of predation. And we also have a cool 3D printed uh, Allosaurus skull. So really cool stuff. I'm really excited to be a part of the Museum of Geosciences at Virginia Tech. It's amazing. And I appreciate you all for giving me a chance to speak about my experience here at the Field Museum. Thank you. Yeah, that's what's up. Thank you. Really appreciate this. He said a lot of big words in a short period of time. I got you. I got you. We are going to go on to our next speaker, introduce uh, Brandon Kilborn. Uh, Brandon Kilborn is an evolutionary biologist and a functional morphologist specializing in the evolution and biomechanical function of limbs of mammals. Originally from Louisiana, he earned his PhD in the University of Chicago in 2011. Okay. Upon finishing his PhD, Brandon relocated to Jena, Germany, where he's currently still in Germany, um, and eventually in 2014 uh, to Berlin, Germany. Uh, he became a fellow at the Berlin Institute for Advanced Studies and later an independent postdoc um, at the Berlin Museum of Natural History. In addition to mammals, Brandon has worked on birds and non-avian dinosaurs. So we are gonna turn the tables over to Brandon Kilborn. Thanks, Yolanda, and thanks for the invitation. So let's see. Um, oops. Okay. So yeah, to, I'm just gonna give you guys just a kind of a career overview of myself. Um, so yeah, just to kind of open things up. Um, yeah, so my background is that I really combine two fields in my research. The first field we can say is sort of biomechanics or functional morphology. And in this, we're using the laws of physics and engineering theory to understand how, say, mammals or dinosaurs run or climb. Then in the other field, I'm really looking at evolution. 
And how do you know lineages and species evolve? How do, does their anatomy evolve over time? And I'm combining this sort of biomechanics and evolution using museums-based collections research to get at this theme of the evolution of adaptations um, in different groups of organisms. So my own history is that I um, started at Louisiana State University for my undergrad. And yeah, I mean, the kind of the first hurdle I had in my career was really the choice of major, because I had a dream to be a sort of a paleobiologist. And there's a, really two ways to do that. One, either you go into geology or you go into biology. And whatever one you don't major in, you minor in. Um, but I had some very strong opposition to this from my parents, where they were very concerned about, you know, will I have, say, an easy time getting a job when I'm finished? What will my income be? So they had really no experience of someone going to academia. And so this kind of created a bit of tension uh, during my undergraduate years. So I came up with a compromise where I decided to major in biological engineering and get a background in biomechanics and physics and engineering. But I also had a student worker job on campus with a vertebrate paleontologist. And so I sort of, you know, took the best of both worlds to try to get myself the, the background I needed. And I mean, one thing I want to say here um, for anyone who's looking to sort of like get in this career path is that if you have a chance for undergraduate research, it is absolutely excellent. And I would only encourage it if you, if you can do this to get a student worker job. So my first mentor uh, at LSU was Professor Judith Chabot. And so she gave me my first real research opportunities. And, you know, we're looking at the evolution of mammals from Louisiana, so fossil mammals from Louisiana. And she also kind of gave me these sort of early career tips of how to sort of strategize for an academic career from day one. And she's also really instrumental in sort of giving me my first opportunities to go to conferences and start networking with different scientists and also pushing me to do research internships. And so working with her, I also had sort of my first entrusted responsibility in academia. And that was like running an acid washing lab. So taking um, rock, dissolving it in highly concentrated uh, vinegar, and then looking for these sort of um, micro fossils uh, from the result. And so, you know, having that sort of responsibility entrusted to me was really something eye opening and really something um, affirming for my early career. Then my other mentor at LSU was Professor Mary Beth Lima, where she was actually an engineering uh, professor, but she did a lot to really sort of put me on the, the academic career path and kind of gave me guidance about what to do and what steps to take um, as an undergraduate. She also taught me about service learning and giving back to the community. And then she also gave me a lot of encouragement, um, you know, because I'm trying to pursue paleontology in the engineering department. It was really a mismatch. But she was very encouraging and tried to like really guide me um, to get where I wanted to go in life. And so from terms of the community involvement, um, part of her research is that she builds safe playgrounds in disadvantaged communities in Baton Rouge. And so it was really nice uh, to be, be part of these projects. So during my undergraduate years, I was also an intern at the Denver Museum of, of Nature and Science. Uh, so this was summer 2003, and this was a real chance for, for independence for me. So both professionally and privately, because it's my first real time being alone by myself in a, in a place that's not my home or is not, you know, the, the college dorm. And then it was also a chance to do more or less independent research where kind of the day-to-day -day operations I was doing all by myself with guidance from a mentor. And so it was also my first real crack at dinosaur research. Um, and yeah, so this was a really a formative experience. So my mentor there was Dr. Kenneth Carpenter, who's a specialist on ankylosaurs or these armored dinosaurs. And we we described this skeleton from this dinosaur called Gorgolosaurus parkinorum. So it had been described a little bit before, but not in detail. So for this experience, I learned how to work with skeletal anatomy, how to describe it, the terminology, and then how to compare different kinds of anatomies and species. And then I learned kind of the first, some of the first fundamentals of doing scientific research, like how to do a literature review properly, how to edit figures and write a manuscript, so, you know, how to report like observations. And then after this, I did two more summer internships at the Field Museum of Natural History, again, with sort of this independence tied into this, where I'm living in Chicago, so a much bigger city than Denver alone uh, for the first time. And then also, you know, more sort of independent research. And this time I was working on dinosaurs and mammals. And again, this sort of guided mentoring situation 
what was really key here is that I learned how to do hypothesis testing and how to build a hypothesis and how to like wrap a research program around a hypothesis. And so here I worked with Dr. Peter Makovicki, who uh, was a, the former um, curator of dinosaurs and fossil reptiles at the Field Museum. And he's a specialist on theropod or meat-eating dinosaurs and ceratopsians, which are horned dinosaurs. And we were looking, really looking at how do limb bones grow and change proportion as animals grow from, say, juveniles or babies to adults. And so this is my first project looking at limb bone growth and biomechanics and locomotion. And again, like it's also like learning how to use statistics to test hypotheses. And so again, this is like sort of like a bedrock experience for my scientific career. And so if you guys have a chance also for doing internships, like summer internships or RU internships, I can only, only encourage you to do this because I mean, it's so important to get you that early training. And then that early training can set you up for a longer career path and better opportunities down the line. So then I started my PhD at the University of Chicago. And that was kind of like a spinoff from being, uh, in a way, I mean, I had to apply to Chicago and get admitted, but in some ways it's like a spinoff from doing the internships. So I already knew people at the museum, I knew people at the university. And so it just kind of was like the next stepping stone in that career path. And so here for my PhD, I wanted to combine using my engineering sort of expertise and background with just doing organismal biology and looking at anatomy as well. And so to give you a little bit of context about um, what I was doing there, so I was looking at limb size and shape in mammals and what does that mean for the locomotion and their evolution. So to give you some context, um, as a limb increases in size, increases in mass, it has a greater resistance to being swung back and forth. So like if you think if you're walking, you swing your limbs to take the next step, right? So the bigger that limb, the more resistance it has to being swung back and forth. And then if that limb is, say, heavy-footed or just has, yeah, a really massive foot, there's also a greater resistance to being swung back and forth. And so the formal term for this swinging resistance is the moment of inertia. And so the moment of inertia is just the function of size and shape of the limb. And I was asking the question, okay, as mammals increase in size and the limbs get longer, how does this moment of inertia or this swinging resistance scale or change in body size? So I looked at 44 species of mammal, and what was key is I had to actually dissect limbs um, from the body or the carcass of dead animals, because um, I wasn't hunting live animals, and swinging them back and forth to actually measure this resistance to swinging them back and forth. And so what I found is that, you know, we have a uh, null hypothesis of what the moment of inertia should be for these larger like um, hoofed animals, these ungulates. If you actually measure their, their moment of inertia, their scaling relationships, their actual value for the swinging resistance is lower than isometries or the null prediction. So they seem to have these specially designed limbs that actually lower the cost to swing them back and forth. So if you think of things like antelope, that they seem to be fleet footed, they seem to be swift and capable of running very fast, this limb design seems to tie into that. And then, you know, being in Chicago, it was kind of my first opportunity to sort of semi-lead research, where you know, I designed my own project. I had very different interests from my advisors and my committee. I learned you know, how to address feasibility and shortcomings and how to really conduct and implement a project from the very beginning. And then another thing I like to like emphasize for you guys is that one skill, if you can learn it early, that's going to help your entire career is grant writing. Like this is a very key, key, key skill you have. And it's like, how do you sell a project? You know, and when you start getting grants, it's sort of like the saying goes, money gets money. Like if you can prove, hey, I know how to sell a project, I know how to run a project, that's only gonna help you get money in the future, right? So that track record is key. And so my first grant was from the National Science Foundation. And then I basically funded the rest of my PhD with small grants from these other institutions, including the Field Museum. And then the other thing about grad school was that I got a chance to see the world for the first time. So I went to the Arctic, I went to Europe, Asia, Africa. And I mean, it just really opened my eyes to sort of humanity. So not even just science, but just humanity how, you know, in some ways people everywhere are the same, like the same basic goals, the same basic drives in life. And so that just made me so curious about seeing the world in different cultures. Um, yeah, and so that gave me this, you know, that made me want to do, like, want to do a postdoc abroad. So um, before I jump to going abroad, I will say like, you know, I kind of paint a rosy picture of academia 
and let me be clear, I would say 90%, 95% has been good, but you know, there are also problems in academia. And I'll say from my own personal experience, I've only encountered this really in the US, not so much in, in Germany or Europe, but I have colleagues who have encountered major problems in Germany. Um, so this is my personal experience. And I mean, I've encountered well-meaning sort of racism where it's like, we want you to stay in academia and we want you to get a job, but you should stay because it'll be easier for you because you're black. I was like, okay, that's meant well, but it's like, you know, especially for an undergraduate age person, that's a very hard thing to process. And I had to talk to my other mentor about it um, and get it straightened out. So this made me feel really uncomfortable. Um, and then I've also been in situations where I've been sitting in like a lecture or seminar and someone wants to talk about race and intelligence, but I'm the only black person in the room. And is, you know, that's just blunt humiliation. Or I've also been harassed behind closed doors by people one-on-one. -on -one. So, and you know, the other thing is if you like notice all the mentors I showed, they're not black people. So like, you're also kind of, I mean, I think things are really changing now and that's a great thing, but you know, kind of from my time coming up, it was a bit isolating um, cause you don't really see anyone that looks like you. So moving on to Germany after Chicago, um, my first real experience abroad, like living there. And you know, I was working on a project on birds and anatomy and biomechanics. And you know, this is really my chance to go abroad, but it was a bit hard because I went from Chicago, like three million people, to a town of one hundred twenty thousand people, and that was like a big culture shock. And that was it was really hard to adjust. And this is uh, what a friend of mine jokes is my favorite place in Jena, the train station. So uh, you know, every weekend or not every weekend, but most weekends, I just got got the hell out of there, um, and I went to a bigger city, either in Germany, the rest of Europe, and just got a chance to see the world again. Um, and so, yeah, I just try to make the most of it. And then, you know, the other experience of just going to a place where you don't speak the language and kind of how that forces you to grow as a person. Um, I would encourage, you know, living abroad if you can, at least for a few years. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely something that's not easy. So in Yena, we had a project where we were looking at bird locomotion. And uh, we were comparing, again, so if you think of this moment of inertia, the swinging resistance, we compared three birds, one with overall lightweight limbs, one with overall massive limbs, and one with long, say, heavy-footed limbs. And we used x-ray video to actually look at them locomoting. And what we were really interested in were these sort of joint angles between the different limb, limb bones. And so um, what we're really interested in, I would say, is the joint um, flexion. So the, you know, how am I flexing my elbow? And what we found is that birds with overall massive limbs and birds that say long, heavy-footed limbs, they flex their limbs more during locomotion. And by flexing their limbs more, they can reduce that swinging resistance, that moment of inertia as a locobone. And so it's like, okay, so these birds that have these really heavy sort of, for lack of a better term, clumsy limbs, they actually sort of change the way they move their limbs to compensate for that. And then, you know, so we were like really happy with that result. So then from Jena, I went to Berlin to this Wissenschaftskollege place. Um, so it's a six month fellowship, so not long term, but it's a really unique place to be because I'm not only interacting with other biologists, but I'm also interacting with um, sociologists and historians and composers. Uh, so that's like almost like a really a magical place to be at because, you know, I'm with the say composer and they're just explaining to me like music from the, the ground up with complete patience. And so I found out about this place through a colleague. So again, like and one thing to think about is networking, right? So if this colleague hadn't sent me the email about this place. I would never have known about it. So and that colleague would be Sush Moretti. Um, and so yeah, so there the Vision Shouts colleague, um, to go quickly, um, I sort of like started a new passion and that's pursuing poetry. And so, you know, at the time, you know, I kind of joined the building poetry scene, did workshops, and then two colleagues there, uh, Dr. Sian Nagai and Dr. David Halperin, who are literal scholars read my work and like, no, you should really try to publish this. And so they gave me some real encouragement to like pursue this. And then in Berlin, you know, after the Wissenschafts call, like I went to the, music, the Museum of Natural History in Berlin and did fully uh, independent research, self-funded research. So again, grant writing enabled me to do that. And then I started working on mammals again. So really mustelid mammals. And so mustelids are like climbing martens, digging badgers, journalist weasels and swimming otters, so this group of carnivorous family of mammals or carnivorous order of mammals. And so for this project, I was like, okay, 
we can think of a biomechanical structure like a femur, and that femur has different parameters like a length or diameter or cross-sectional area. And how are all these different parameters tying in to how the limb evolves? And so using like, you know, swimming otters, digging badgers, climbing martens, and these sort of journalist weasels, I started looking at limbs and said, okay, I'm gonna measure limb bone lengths, limb bone diameters, and cross-sectional areas. I'm going to see, you know, because this limb is composed of different bones and each one has a different length, different diameter, different cross-sectional area. And the question is, okay, as this limb evolves, how are all these different parts, these different parameters evolving together? And so what I found is that the long bone lengths evolve by natural selection, whereas the other parameters like bone diameters and cross-sectional areas, they seem to evolve more by random changes over time. So not really in sort of guided, guiding quote unquote um, process happening here. And so, yeah, um, that's it for my talk. And um, yeah, I, I hope it's informative for you guys. Um, I do have a few extra slides about finding postdocs and jobs. So if you have maybe a question about that, I can also try to answer that and give you some advice. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. This is great. Thank you, Brandon. Really appreciate this. Really appreciate this. Uh, we are going to move on and our next presenter is Albert. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Albert and then he'll uh, take the will from there. Albert Phillips Jr. is the founder and CEO of Free Black Mind Educational Group LLC, a company that creates empowering and educational digital and print resources and programming for black youth. He specializes in urban education and youth development. Albert earned a master of science degree in education from John Hopkins University and a Bachelor of Science degree in Journalism from Morgan State University. Albert resides in Baltimore, Maryland. I want to go ahead and succeed and send the, send the baton over to Albert. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to you, Wanda. Thank you to the Field Museum. Thank you to our, our two presenters who just shared. Um, I really got taken back in time in a way to when I was a child. Um, and I know that I, I used to be a classroom teacher and I know my fifth grade students would have flipped if they would have had a chance to see uh, this uh, presentation. So I'll certainly have to share the recording um, with the school that I used to teach at. Uh, but yes, I'm, I'm so fortunate to be here. I'm happy to be able to go um, after our two presenters. And as you two were presenting, I took a lot of notes because it really connects to what I wanted to share today anyway, which was um, the idea and the thought of navigating um, through, through kind of like an idea phase of like what you want to be and actually getting to that stage of being there, which is a very kind of powerful process. Um, and I think one key part of it, um, one just hugely important part of it is having an understanding of who you are. So that could mean your interests, right, your likes, your dislikes, um, you know, what type of things do you like to do? Uh, what, what type of programs do you like to be involved in? All of these different things um, help you become more grounded in who you are and helps to sort of permeate into career in a way. Um, even with, uh, um, is it Mariah or Maria? I don't want to mispronounce your name. So Mariah. Mariah, thank you yep. so much. Uh, you, I, I love your pictures of um, you and the dinosaurs when you were really young, um, which was, it was hilarious. But I think in a way, right, like your, your, your dad was planting those seeds um, and, and then you started to cultivate them in your own way. You mentioned things like internships. Um, you mentioned going to college. Uh, you talked about a lot of early learning and kind of figuring out your major, figuring out, you know, do I want to go in this direction, do I want to go in that direction? And I'm sure that took a considerable amount of thought and evaluation on it, not just by yourself, but maybe even involving others in that process, right? And trying to bounce ideas off of other people. Uh, you mentioned industry projects, uh, where you embarked in different learning and strategies to figure out um, various skills that you have obviously mastered at this point. And I, and I think it's beautiful uh, to see you too, because you mentioned Jurassic Park. Um, the only black person I remember from that movie was Samuel Jackson. Um, so <laughs> there certainly uh, was not enough representation, right, when it comes to 
um, the careers that you both have. And so I think your presence is, is very powerful. And I appreciate you, Brandon, for explicitly stating that uh, while you were presenting. Um, you also talked about reading books and, and documentaries to, to further your learning and your understanding. So all of this kind of pouring in to your development um, in, a, in a step one sort of phase and then um, transitioning you know, into your first job or your first career. Uh, you both mentioned you know, starting at one place, maybe sort of entry level and then taking on new projects and taking on new jobs and, and getting involved in new, in new tasks and opportunities. And uh, Brandon talked about being able to utilize your network. And I talk to students about that all the time. Like your network is extremely important and it's always around you. And I think you have to be explicit in utilizing your network in ways to benefit you professionally. Um, and I talk to students like, it doesn't just have to be like you, you're at a convention with a business card, like, hey, I'm, I'm James and I want to get a job, right? It can, you can network on TikTok. You can network on Instagram, right? But how are you utilizing these platforms? You know, is it, is it just purely entertainment or are you also looking to learn and to grow? There are sciences on TikTok. There, there are sciences on, on Instagram that are using these platforms to educate, to empower, to network. And so I really encourage our students to, to lean into that because there's a lot that you can learn from that. Um, and then Brandon, you mentioned, um, well, you both mentioned that going through college, which is an experience within itself, you know, being in, being in college, yes, is is very much about the core content, which you're learning in the classroom. You're trying to earn a degree. You're trying to minimize debt, <laughs> all of these good things, but you're also, you're involved in internships in college. You're, you're meeting friends in college and colleagues that can uh, provide you with other opportunities who maybe you can work on a project together in the future. Um, your professors who can write you letters of recommendation and can vouch for you, uh, which are extremely important uh, qualities of college. And then also student organizations. I remember when I was in, uh, when I was attending Morgan State University where I got my undergrad in uh, print journalism, being a part of the National Association of Black Journalists like changed my life. Um, I remember traveling to Orlando to a conference and seeing all of these black journalists who I only saw on like TV and they're just, you know, walking right by you. And you're just like, did you just see, <laughs> you know, did you just see that person? Um, and, you know, my friends and I, we didn't have much money. So it was like five or six of us in this, uh, <laughs> in this, uh, we were in a resort, um, but we were in like a hotel room. Um, we were just packed in there, right? But we really wanted to go and have the experience. And I know one of my friends ended up landing a job at ESPN as a result of, a, of attending that event. And so being able to do that is, is, is hugely important. Uh, Brandon also talked about uh, traveling, which I think is, is, is paramount. Um, I think too often, especially in my city, you know, I, I live in Baltimore and uh, it's very easy to get kind of segmented by like what block you're from or what zip code or what side of town or even just being in the city and, and not going outside of it. And so I was fortunate enough when I was in um, uh, community college, I started a community college route and I was able to go to uh, Italy for three weeks to study abroad. And um, it was a huge culture shock on the first day because I couldn't speak Italian. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was like, maybe we should have taken some Italian classes before we actually went to Italy. Uh, but I couldn't speak the language and I just felt kind of like an outcast uh, for about 24 hours and it took me a little time to adapt and, and feel more like myself. But I learned a lot about myself, you know, being outside of just my city. You know, wh what does it mean to be, excuse me, what does it mean to be who you are outside of the, the confines of the space, the space that you were born and raised in? You know, what it, how does that show up? How does that look? somewhere else. Um, what does your identity mean in other places, right? So I think that's that's hugely important. Um, and I think you, you both mentioned this as well, like developing industry specific skills. Um, so being able to do things within your industry that, you know, you can put on a resume, you can talk about during an interview, um, you can show the results, hey, I participated in this, we achieved this, um, 
you know, these were the steps that we took to get there. These were the partners that we work with. Here are my colleagues who supported in this endeavor. All of that is extremely important uh, when we think about navigating again from kind of like this idea phase to like, I really want to get into this career and these are the steps that I'm going to take. So to me, the, the, the secret sauce is the plan. And in the plan, um, I, I tell students all the time, you don't have to have everything figured out. Like who has everything figured out? Like really? Uh, but you do have to at least have a, a plan or an idea around how you're going to get from kind of step one to that's, I, I don't even want to say like the final step because getting into a career, it's, it's certainly not the final step. There, there are many things that can come after that. And we know we transition and we, and we go to, to different jobs and different employers, or we might even start our own business. So that, that could be a part of it as well. But in the beginning that there has to be this sort of planning and, and, and um, just real thought work that happens, not even just alone, but I think it's important for, you know, as a, as a young person to be able to steer that ship to determine, hey, this is the direction I want to go in. So Brandon, even when you talked about your parents not necessarily understanding or, or, or maybe even believing in what you wanted to major in in college, I, I went through something similar to, with my dad when I, when I told him I wanted to get into journalism. He was like, well, how much money are you going to make? <laughs> he started pulling up Department of Labor statistics and, and all types of things. I'm like, dad, like, this is my dream. <laughs> you know? uh, at least that was, that was one of them. Uh, but, but still being able to, to, to stay steadfast, right? And say, hey, this is really what I want to achieve. It. Okay, maybe I'll tweak it a little bit. Maybe I'll try something different a little bit. But this is where I want to go. And this is, friend, this is how you can help me. Mom, this is how you can help me. Uh, cousin, colleague, uh, teacher, this is how you can help me. And also thinking about being reciprocal. This is how I can benefit you all, right? I, I might be able to support you all in, in your dream because that's that's how you know I believe that our society should work. You know, it shouldn't just be an individualistic sort of thing. So I encourage again to start off with a plan, some ideas. Uh, before jumping into that that job or career, thinking about again when you're on that job, when you're, you're in that career that you really wanted, how are you connecting with others? How are you building yourself up? How are you learning skills? Um, you know, how are you getting ready? And then thinking about transitioning as well, because oftentimes where we start is not where we end. And so, why when you're on that job, you know, who are you making connections with? Are you putting people's numbers in your phone? Are you getting emails? Uh, what are you doing to prepare yourself for that, for that next step? Are you updating your resume, right? Because you've learned all of this stuff and you don't want it to go and kind of by the wayside. You want to be able to plug it in and put it somewhere. So are you updating that resume? And are you getting truly prepared for the next phase in your journey? Um, so that's, that's my secret sauce. And I, I hope that's beneficial. And again, I, um, I thank you all for allowing me to be here today. Just wanna say thank you to every last one of you for joining us today. Uh, Albert, Mariah, Brandon, really appreciate this. Um, we have uh, about 15 minutes or so left and I am going to go into some, some questions for every last one of you. Um, you can pick and choose who wants to answer it first. There's no order uh, whatsoever. Um, I'm gonna I'm go ahead and start off with this. Uh, any of our participants that are still here, really appreciate you guys for staying alongside with us. Uh, please put your questions in the Q and A, and or also put them in the chat um, so we can we can see them, whichever you feel most comfortable doing. We have some pre-submitted questions, and I'd like to go ahead and read off those questions uh, ahead of time. Some of these are designated to a particular person; others um, are just open for anybody to be able to answer. Um. So here's a question right here, since we uh, actually just had Albert on, uh, we'll just keep the flow going. Uh, do you plan on writing another book? And for those that don't know, I put his book in the chat. It's called uh, Albert, Phillips, Albert Phillips Jr. Y'all hiring? <laughs> the Black Teens Guide to Navigating Employment. Um, so that was a question that we have. Do you plan on writing another book? Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely go check out the first one. Uh, y'all hiring, you can get it at y'allhiring.com. 
But yes, so when it comes to this particular book, I'm working on a um, discussion in the activity guide that should be out in the next few weeks. And then uh, we all talked about graduate school. So I went to graduate school once. I'm planning to go back again. <laughs> so um, I wanna do a creative writing and publishing arts program because uh, I'm really leaning into that direction. And so much, much more is on the way. I, I plan on putting out a collection of essays, hopefully uh, before the end of next year, and then a memoir to follow that. So more books are coming up soon. Great to hear, great to hear. Uh, we do have a copy for those that work here at the Field Museum. Uh, I took the uh, liberty to go back and get us one um, here and that's at our library. So just kind of putting that out there for y'all. We do have uh, a copy here at the, at the museum. Um, this one is for uh, Mariah and Brandon. Uh, this question uh, in particular, uh, how would you encourage young African-Americans in particular to pursue the field that you're currently in? So you know what you were thinking of, you know your routes, but now where you stand, now where, you, where you've landed, how would you encourage them to pursue the field that you're currently in? Well, I would definitely say just always like, if you're very passionate about something, always just go for it regardless. Like don't let anything get you down and try to like stop you. Because I've had many instances where I had a whole bunch of like naysayers try to say, oh, well that field and this and that. But it's important to just say, hey, this is what makes my heart sing. This is what, very, this is very important to me. This is what I wanna pursue. Then just definitely go for it. And I also say, definitely seek out like mentors for sure. Different mentor that's always gonna be there to bat for you and have your back. Um, in your particular like field that you want to go in, especially if you do want to go into paleontology. And one of the things I noticed when growing up, there wasn't very much like representation for paleontology. And even as I went through graduate school, I still didn't quite have like mentors that look like me, but it's important to make allies for sure, make allies and talk to different mentors or people who was willing to support you on all levels to see you succeed in that dream. And just never give up for sure, seek out different like mentorships, allies. And also I suggest, um, Definitely going through different like uh, either programs or different like uh, I want to say either programs or like different like clubs or different communities that are there to help you succeed in science. I know there's recently a place called Black and Natural History Museum that I just found out about. I think like in late 2021, so I joined that as well. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I also joined SACNAS, uh, Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science. So joining those different like organizations and programs also help you meet other people of color and other people who look like you in different types of field in STEM or in like paleontology or whatever field you want to pursue. So definitely never let anything stop you from pursuing your dreams at all. Just go for it. And I always just find that support system and keep working hard and do internships and just finding out what really fits for you and what's best for you at the end of the day and what you love, your passion, so. Yeah, uh, I agree with everything Mariah said. So, I mean, one, if you know what you're passionate about, try to educate yourself. So documentaries, reading books, like trying to, you know, specialist literature a little bit, see if you can understand it. And then also reach out to people, like build that network. And even if say, people don't really look like you, you don't see the representation, most people I've met in my field are very welcoming to these sort of like people kind of early on the path to academia or into paleontology or biology, Like they want to encourage the next generation. And so most people are actually really, really supportive and really encouraging. And they will take at least some time out to communicate with you. Um, and so I would say definitely sort of try to build that network and don't be afraid to contact someone. It's like, you know, if you're starting to go into like a little bit of special literature, like reading books and kind of seeing who's cited you know, contact those people, you know, don't, don't be afraid, like try to reach out. And then if you have opportunities for undergraduate research, if you have opportunities for internships, you know, embrace those opportunities and, you know, don't shy away. I mean, I think the worst thing you can do is doubt yourself and be shy at this step, you know, really go for it and really believe in yourself. And yeah, and I'm really, you know, as you go, go further forward and go further, you meet more people, you network, is a little bit of give and take, as Albert said, right? You know, you're helping them, they're helping you, and vice versa. And so we're trying to build that relationships with people, this network. It also is going to give you new opportunities, maybe that you would not find on your own. So I would say this uh, is what I'd recommend. Great, thank you, thank you. Let me get some uh, Q and A's here. So let me click on these, see what we have. 
Um, this is good. So Arlene Lee, if you have a question, uh, and Arlene's information is, is in the Q&A as well. Um, but if you are able and willing to share how you, Mariah, made that track way, I and campers would love that. Um, thank you in advance. This is in, in incredible. Um, and people are, are interested uh, for our, our panelists in reaching out personally as, as well. Uh, yeah, so with making that like simulated trackway, uh, you usually you basically just take like a neoprene rug. I think we had about 20 feet, uh, which was a little bit too large for us. So we had cut it into a uh, half, make uh, both uh, sets like 10 feet, 10 feet. Um, and from there, you just take like some spray paint. And if you have a stencil, a stencil of like an actual like dinosaur track, or you can even make a stencil up of a dinosaur track, um, take the stencil. And this is good to do outside, like take it outside and on your neoprene rug, just take the stencil and take some spray paint and just like go over. I had a student actually work on it uh, last semester and he had blast doing it. So it's just basically taking a neoprene rug, um, some stencils of like a dinosaur track or any type of track that you want to make up yourself or Ours is actually the University of Virginia Tech is actually based on like a real dinosaur track um, that's here in Virginia. I think it's in Manassas, but yeah, that's what we had um, a stencil of a dinosaur track and just like spray paint it. And if you want to, you can like do like actual like, you know, measurements, like saying, oh, I'm just going to have it go like, you know, a few feet or smaller. So yeah, just pretty simple. And I think you can also like Google it as well. I think the American Museum of like Natural History also has like tutorials and like steps online, like uh, more materials and how they've gone about it in the past. So it's actually a pretty fun activity just to get students to realize what we can learn from uh, dinosaur behavior without actually having the fossils itself, but what we can learn from the tracks, like how fast the dinosaur was going and so forth. And was it an adult or was it a juvenile? So it's actually a pretty cool activity. I had fun doing an outreach activity with my students. So. Yeah, pretty simple stuff and uh, materials to make it. Thank you for explaining that. I was actually kind of paying attention myself. I'm like, let me look at how I could do that too. Uh, so <laughs> appreciate, appreciate y'all for asking that question. Uh, we have another question. Uh, and this, I think, can easily be for all, uh, for all uh, three panelists, uh, especially if you're going to a specific field and career, something that you notice. Um, how do you show curiosity or passion or passion on a job application? Because real talk, you look at a job application, it's like just numbers, right? It's like just names in black ink. Um, and it looks, it default just looks boring. You may find your way into adding a picture if you are one of those individuals that does that. But how do you show curiosity and passion uh, on that job description? Uh, I, I can start. I think with the application is probably difficult because they are pretty generic, um, boring even to say. But I think when you when you think about your uh, cover letter, that's an opportunity opportunity for you to expound upon uh, what you've learned, things that you've listed on your um, resume. You can get into uh, some more specifics there, add more color and flavor to who you are and, and why the job should uh, seek you out. Um, and then also on the resume, I think that's, a, that's another opportunity for you to show, you know, any certifications that you have, any special achievements, education, work experience, um, all of these types of things can, can be helpful in your search. On the actual application though, that there may not be much space uh, or opportunity to do that. Some applications may have a, a section where you can maybe, you know, write a, a small paragraph or so um, about a question that they might ask you, but um, definitely look into the, the cover letter and resume to also do that. Uh, yeah, I pretty much agree with everything that Albert says. It's just basically really taking your cover letter and just like making it shine, really, um, because the application project uh, process can be pretty, you know, tedious, I will admit. But you have to just take like your cover letter or anything that they're asking, like writing samples, things like that, and just like make yourself shine, like bring out like this is what I can bring to like, you know, your institution or your university, things like that. Um, things that you've learned along the way that's very like value to yourself, but also the company as well. So just like making yourself like shine. Um, through that whole like process of like writing the cover letter, just like really also tailoring it to the specific position that you want as well. Um, that's very important. And yeah, just pretty much, I think the cover letter is just the biggest thing. Like, yes, the application is um, 
definitely tedious, but I think for sure, like that cover letter is pretty important because then you get a chance to really show who you are and your personality, but also what you have to bring to the table and just like how um, you yourself is just like a strong applicant. So definitely like make yourself shine through the whole like cover letter as well. And yeah, just like if you're passionate about, about a position, go for it for sure. So. Yeah, I would agree with everything Mariah and Albert said. So I think the cover letter is, is going to be one, the cover letter number one, the resume number two. And I think the cover letter, as I said, is kind of what makes you shine, kind of what, you know, I, I tell people it's kind of what makes you unique, like what makes you stand out from everyone else applying, what sets you apart from everyone else applying. And, you know, in some ways, I think a cover letter and the, and the CV, a resume kind of go hand in hand, like those kind of key points from the resume you highlight them and kind of explain them or expound upon them a bit in the cover letter. And that helps set you apart. And the other thing I would say is for both the cover letter and the resume, get feedback. If you have a mentor, give that, give those materials to your mentor, get them to colleagues in your field who may be a little bit more advanced than you and just get their feedback and get, you know, get their opinion on what, what you've written. And one thing I'll say about the resume or CV how it's structured it really matters. And so don't, don't, you know, just kind of do something haphazard, like really have some intent in how you structure that document and get feedback on it. Cause I know like when I was first applying for post office and things, I was, you know, kind of sending out this, the CV that was in hindsight, terrible, like terribly formatted. And I remember at one point I sent to a colleague, someone not even senior to me, someone that's my peer. And they're like, no dude, you're doing this all wrong. <laughs> so, you know, I had to like, go and like reformat my entire CV. And so, yeah, I mean, definitely this, the cover letter and the CV are key, but be sure you get feedback on those documents. All right, we have about two minutes and I'm gonna try to push in one last question. Um, in the chat here, we have from Sarah, uh, how, and I think she's uh, talking to everybody here. How do you manage situations of racism or discrimination? I can, I can start. Um, so it was very key for me, even in the book, to explicitly talk about uh, racism, especially when it comes to jobs, because oftentimes workforce development resources ignore it. It's like if you got your resume and you got your cover letter and you got your suit on, everything will be fine. But it's like <laughs> there are a lot of other things um, that can be challenging in the workplace. So I think one thing that I encourage is just having a general understanding of it. The first chapter in my book is on hiring discrimination uh, because I thought it was it was very important just for especially teens to understand it because oftentimes adults we're, we're dealing with it, we're talking about it, but are we having those conversations with teens and, and helping to uh, prepare them not just to understand it, but to even challenge it, right? Um, so I think one just is, is taking note of what you perceive as discriminatory practices, right? Like even if you don't fully know that it is or not, taking note of it and, and documenting it because uh, that's very important. Um, two is understanding just your rights as a worker, right? Like is your job pushing you to work maybe too many hours and that's, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and there's a lot of um, information on like the, the Department of Labor website that, that goes into just like your rights as a worker of course, they're different depending upon the state that you live in and, and, and uh, the type of jobs you have, different things like that. But it's important just to have some, some level of, of, of uh, basic understanding of that. And then three, and this is, this is more of a, this is more of a, uh, I would say a, a more serious sort of allegation that you might have is hiring an employment uh, lawyer if necessary or even filing um, an official grievance, right? There's a, there's a process for these things. So I think it's just important for people to know that, hey, there are things in place um, to help support you. Um, I'm not gonna act like all of them are foolproof. I'm also not gonna act like they all are free, right? Cause some things uh, cost money, unfortunately, in order to protect yourself, but um, there are things that exist and as they say, you know, it's, it's power in numbers. So if you're dealing with something that other people are dealing with, then maybe you all can, can come together to kind of deal with it. Um, but, you know, it's important just to continue to, to be an advocate for yourself and for, and for people like you as well. Um, you know, don't just look out for yourself. If somebody else is dealing with something, 
you know, you, you may want to vouch for them, right? If, if you feel comfortable and you acknowledge what they're sharing as well, um, because you will want people to kind of uh, stand up for your cause. So uh, those are the things that I will offer. Yeah, I definitely agree with what Albert was like saying. He hit the uh, hammer right on the nail for sure. It's just like um, just taking notes of things that you think is like, you know, very like negative or like discriminatory. And also just having like a big support system as well. Someone that you can like um, have support you, um, lean on their shoulders and just say, hey, this is what's going down in the workforce or workplace. And just like talk about it and be able to just know your rights in general to like what to report things. Um, and I think the big thing is just having a big support system of people that you can like talk to, confide in as well. So it's definitely knowing your rights and yeah, taking notes of everything that's pretty shady, anything like that. So yeah, he pretty much like hit the hammer on the nail. Yeah, I agree with everything uh, Albert and Mariah said. Um, the only thing I could say that might be slightly different is that I, you know, I don't, I don't know how comfortable I feel saying this. Is just depending on your exact situation and how much discrimination you're encountering, and whether you have a network of people around you or not. Like if you feel a bit isolated, this kind of becomes more of a challenge. So you should one know your rights, and that's it. like in all situations, whether you have a network or not, know your rights. But the other thing I'll kind of try to warn you about is like, if you're gonna be somewhere for six years, then you need a strategy to cope with this. You know, so figure out what your rights are, how do you, how do you wanna like navigate this situation? If you're gonna be somewhere for like a summer, then maybe, okay, I'm gonna report to my mentor of what's happening, or I'm gonna like report to their, my mentor's boss. But at the other time you might say, okay, well, I'm gonna pick and choose my battles. I'm out of here at the end of the summer. And I'm just gonna like take what I can from the situation, you know what what I can what I can take that's positive. I'm gonna leave behind the negative and try not to like affect me too much. I mean, it always does affect you somehow, and just make the most of it. Because um, the thing is, if you're in a situation where you're isolated, and you don't have a network, and you're fighting, fighting, fighting over every little thing that happens, you're gonna burn out. You know, it, it's it's you know you're gonna be completely stressed out. And so you should fight for yourself. You should fight for your rights. But at the same time, you need to learn, learn how to navigate the situation. And I know that's not the best answer to give you or maybe the most hopeful answer to give you. But, it, you know, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I have some colleagues who kind of just do burn out, you know, trying to fight, fight, fight. Um, so, yeah, I would say know your rights, the network if you can, but also try to figure out the situation if you don't have that that network, because um, that's going to be a lot harder. Um, but you can you can survive it. You can you know have the grit to get through it. Um, but you kind of figure out a strategy for yourself, if, if that makes any sense. Thank you all. Uh, these were great answers um, and great questions um, to everybody that participated. We are a tad bit uh, over time, um, but that's okay uh, because we were killing it, literally. Uh, so I really appreciate everybody's time joining us in from all over the country, our panelists, as well as our participants, um, as well as our staff. I uh, really appreciate you all. Um, I wanna keep you on board uh, Black History Month is not over with yet. Uh, we have Darlene Dowdy Pritchard, a collections assistant in botany uh, that is going to be on Meet a Museum Insider Wednesday, February 23rd. So just kind of uh, keep your eye open uh, for some more details coming out via our website here at the museum and also our social media pages too. Um, so I just want to tell you all, thank you. Uh, we do have a lot of your comments still in the chat, um, and I am able to share out our scientists and our educators' um, uh, information in the sense of if you want to reach out to me, you can do so. If you also want to reach out to their LinkedIn accounts, their own websites and whatnot, you can do that as well. Uh, please don't be a stranger. Thank you, and join us again on Wednesday. You all have a great day. <laughs>